Now, I always like to start with something serious as well, so I have to ask you a question. Have any of you ever heard a boring homily? Let's see if I show of hands. Okay, I have. Have any of you ever given a boring homily? I have. Now you're all getting really nervous, thinking, uh-oh. All right, so, you know, I can't guarantee that this will not be boring, but I would like to tell you about a priest on the East Coast. Sisters, if you know who it is, keep your mouths buttoned over there, okay? But he was notorious for giving boring homilies each and every Sunday. Actually, he was so good at giving boring homilies that he was known as a miracle worker because he was curing people of insomnia. <laughs> people were coming from miles around, calling the rectory for days before the Sunday Mass, finding out what was the Mass schedule so that they could come and at least get some relief from insomnia for that Mass. But after many years of curing people from all over the diocese, people thought it might be a good idea to transfer him to another location. So people started writing to the bishop. Now, Bishop, you'll know what this is like because you get a lot of fan mail every day. And mixed in with the fan mail, you probably get some letters of request and even a complaint once or twice during a decade. <laughs> and so people were writing prolifically to the bishop. Bags of mail were coming in requesting to be transferred. So the bishop called him in for tea one day. Now, for those of you who don't travel in church circles, call, being called in for tea to the bishop's residence does not mean you're being named a monsignor. <laughs> So the kindly soul that he was went to the bishop's residence, and in the course of conversation, the bishop said, Father, would you be open to suggest some suggestions on how to give a good homily? And the priest was a very holy priest, wonderful priest. Everyone loved him, just couldn't preach. So he said, oh yes, Your Excellency, I'd love some, some suggestions. So the bishop said, well, Father, you need to give a good introduction to get the people's attention and then a good short message and a good ending to send them home with something. And the priest looked at him with a blank stare. And so the bishop said, well, do you want me to explain a little bit more? So he said, yes. <laughs> so the bishop said, well, Father, let's just pretend that you're preaching on a feast of Our Lady. You get up at the pulpit and you say, my dear people, I have something very important to tell you today. See, I got your attention. <laughs> and then you continue by saying, I am in love. And then you continue, I am in love with a very beautiful woman. I am in love with a very beautiful married woman. And then you continue on, her name is Mary. And you begin your homily on Our Lady. And then the rest goes on from there. So he goes back to his parish and about two weeks later, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. So he gets up at the pulpit, he reads the gospel and says, my dear people, I have something very important to tell you today. They were shocked. He hadn't said anything important in eight years. And he continued. The bishop is in love. <laughs> Realizing he had got their attention, something he knew nothing of, he continued. The bishop is in love with a very beautiful woman. At this you could have heard a pin drop in the church. Eyes were glued on him. And he continued, The bishop is in love with a very beautiful married woman. At this, people were writing names of candidates on the bulletin and passing them person to person. He was so stunned that he had gotten their attention that he paused for a moment and said, And... For the life of me, I can't remember her name. <laughs> I 
too am in love with a very beautiful married woman. I know her name, it is Mary. All right? She's well over 2,000 years old, so don't get nervous. All right? I've always had a great devotion to Our Lady, so I'm thrilled to be able to share a few sentiments with you tonight on the verge of the 100th anniversary of Our Lady of Fatima. Even my chalice from ordination is a gold chalice with a blue node, the blue and gold for Our Lady. She has always, always been a dear friend to me. And actually, I'm here in Chicago because of Our Lady. I did not want to come here for anything. <laughs> and if Cardinal George was alive, he would tell you that, because he asked three times for me to come out here. You, could, you know this, Father Dan, right? And so it was in Lourdes. I was over there giving a youth retreat, and I went down to the grotto, one o'clock in the morning, because I couldn't sleep. I said, Mary, come on, you've got to come through for me, because this is not going to work. I don't know what to do with this. And like a bolt of lightning, it was a miserable night, cold rain. I heard as clear as a bell in my soul, you will go to Chicago, but you must be willing to suffer for my son. So I thought, okay, well, that's about as clear as you can get. <laughs> and then, should I have thought I was dreaming, the next day at lunch, I was having lunch at the residence where the priests stay at Lourdes, and a brother who was also staying there got up after lunch and said, Father, could you do this? I, I talk a lot. And so I'm abundantly verbal. So I was just chatting away at the table. I don't even know what I was saying because half of them didn't speak English. But <laughs> not that it mattered. But at any rate, so he says, Father, could you stay for a few minutes after lunch? You're in a hurry. I said, no, 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 I'll stay. So he goes, all right. So he goes up to his room. He comes down and he brings this. It is one of the first miraculous medals ever struck in France. His grandmother had it, and if you notice, it's not even the shape of a miraculous medal as we know them. The shape changed. This was on the first press, and it was passed on through his family. And when it was given to him, his mother said to him, this is not for you. There will be a day when you will know who Our Lady wants to get this, because she needs to get a message to that person. So I was like, well, that's clear. So, <laughs> so I just wanted to give a little caveat, because my bigger devotion is to Our Lady of Lourdes. So that's all I wanted to say. Truth in advertising. But I do love Our Lady of Fatima. She points us to Our Lord. She wanted a chapel built in that little spot of the Cova de Iria. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it well in the Portuguese. But when I was there, in Fatima, we had the chance to go as chaplains on groups that go over there. And her message to me is a message of hope because she points us to her son. Back on the west side, Bishop Okluya in West Humboldt Park is one of the areas of Chicago. There are two areas of Chicago known for shootings and violence. One is our neighborhood on the west side, the others on the south side in the Englewood area. We have a Bible study and a seniors program every Tuesday. And right before Christmas a year ago, one of the elderly black ladies got up. We have about 50 or 60 of them. They are a riot. <laughs> she up and says, Father Bob, I'd like to say something to the group. So I said, go right ahead. You know, She said, I got this poem in our church, and I'd like to share it with everybody, and I'd like to share it with you tonight. The greatest man in history is Jesus. He had no servants, yet they call him master. He had no degrees, yet they call him teacher. He had no medicine, yet they call him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. And it is that Jesus whom Mary points us to. And those words, do whatever he tells you, what powerful words. And then the advice that Mary gave at Fatima to those three little children, a message of prayer, conversion, and consecration at a time when the world was coming apart at the seams. Russia was a huge threat. 
an apparition that mentions Russia, mentions war, famine. And we live in a difficult era right now as well. I don't know about any of you. I watched a tower go down with my own eyes on September 11th. I'll never forget the day. I will never forget the buildings in New York shaking from the fighter jets going up and down Manhattan all day. I will never forget giving general absolution to 2,000 firefighters at, gathered at our fire station, which abuts our property, before they went down and several of them never came home. And once the first tower fell, they stopped sending people down there. And I went over and did a prayer service there, and we had a lineup, a lineup of these big gorillas crying and going to confession, not knowing what was going to happen. Conversion. Conversion. We live in the same difficult era, and we need hope. And people ask, what should we do? The answer is clear. Pray. Convert your life to what? To the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we have to be clear about it. We can't just leave it as conversion. Change. Good, I'll change. I'll get my hair cut. <laughs> change. Good. I'll put on a what? We'll wear a summer habit. Baloney. That's not change. That's not transformation. That's not conversion and then consecration to our Lord. That's what's so key. I don't know about any of you, but we have discussions with people all the time, don't we, about whatever issue, the right to life, you name it. But you know as well as I do, like the old saying says, to those who have faith, no explanation is necessary, and to those who have no faith, no explanation is possible. What is our primary obligation right now? To share the faith, and we are in a crisis of faith. If you want to ask my opinion. You didn't, but I'm telling you. <laughs> it's a crisis of faith, and it begins with prayer. And for many people, they don't know what prayer is. I would make that claim. I have so many people say, Father, teach us how to pray. We don't even know how to pray. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, one in heaven, help me in the kingdom. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord. It's like speed reading. We have to take a look at this prayer. And for some people, I think we're like a man that I read about recently who was late for an important reading meeting, and he was searching desperately for a parking spot in a crowded parking lot. Looking up to the sky, he said in prayer, Lord, if you find me a parking spot, I promise to start going to church again. He didn't finish the sentence when a spot opened up right in front of him. And the man looked right back up and said, Lord, never mind, I just found the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Our prayer has to go deeper. And the prayer of the rosary. What is the rosary? The rosary is a meditation on the mysteries of our salvation centered on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a meditation. We've got to reflect. We've got to think. We have to use not only our mouth, but our whole being to enter in. And that's something that's so challenging for us. I was in St. Peter's Square. I happened to be at the Vatican for meetings for prior to one of the World Youth Days. And we just happened to be there when Pope John Paul II pronounced that there would be five more mysteries of the rosary, the luminous mysteries, which again, help us to focus in on the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And like Mary, ponder these things in her heart. That's what we have to do, ponder these beautiful mysteries in our hearts to become men and women of deeper prayer and religious, religious, we live with Jesus. He's in our chapel. I remember the alderman out on the west side came to meet me when I first got to Chicago, when I first moved into Iowa Street, because the buildings weren't usable and livable. So I lived at the neighboring rectory for a while while renovations were being done. And he came and he said to me, I can't believe you're out here all by yourself. I said, I'm not by myself at all. He said, oh, I thought you were by yourself. I said, oh, no. 
I said, I have a big German Shepherd, Liberty, and she was big and she had big teeth. <laughs> and nobody came near her. People would say hello to her. I'd go out and walk the dog. They'd be like, across the street, Father, nice to see you. She'll come and say hello. Not with that, not with that wolf. <laughs> And so he said, well, who else do you have? I said, Jesus. Jesus, he's right here in the tabernacle. We have the privilege to live with our Lord in our own home, under our own roof. Does it change us? Pope Benedict, when he spoke to the bishops in Washington, said, time spent in prayer is never wasted, however urgent the duties that press upon us from every side. Adoration of Christ our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament prolongs and intensifies the union with Him that is established through the Eucharistic celebration. Mother Teresa, the fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. The fruit of service is peace. We all clamor for peace. And Mother Teresa points us in the right direction of where it starts, with silence. And if you mention the word silence, people break out in hives, <laughs> right? We wake up in the morning to tunage, the alarm clock, dun da dun da dun whatever, whatever they have to you know, Sometimes you hear, you're like, what is that? It's someone's alarm clock. What is this? People get into the shower, and they have waterproof mechanisms that you, you, you can't get away from it. We have to be quiet be able to be in communication with our Lord. Now, let's take a look at Fatima. Mary said to little Lucia, Jesus wishes to make use of you. Remember those words, folks. Jesus wishes to make use of you. As I'm looking around this room, there's an army of people here, an army, and Jesus wishes to make use of you to rebuild the church, to rebuild the church, not redesign the church, okay? Jesus was clear to St. Francis at San Damiano. Francis, rebuild my church for as you see it's falling into ruin. After the Second Vatican Council, we had a lot of architects come in and wanted to redesign it. I'm not so sure he said redesign, okay? So I think we're all on the same wavelength. Now, keep an eye on the clock, as some of you are, too, so don't worry. I only, I only have seven more pages here. And you see, the first half of the page went really quick. We, like those kids, are chosen, called, and consecrated, and we're consecrated for something, for mission. For mission, what does that mean? The great commissioning, go forth, make disciples of all nations. My eighth grade teacher, Sister Dolores, I don't remember a thing she taught us, except for one thing. Her favorite word, move. <laughs> move, that was her favorite word. I don't know what it was, we all moved, but she was always like, move. No matter where we were, we were in the wrong spot. Move, move. I always loved her. Move, move. <laughs> Folks, we gotta move, we gotta move. We got things to do, the salvation of souls out there. That's what it's all about. That's what Mary was worried about, the salvation of souls. That's why she needs us to pray. That's why she needs us to convert. And that's why she needs us to be consecrated to her son. And then, and this I learned in second grade from little sister Lawrence. I thought she was a giant. And then I went back to grade school when I was elder, Lee. I realized she was no taller than one of these chairs. But she seemed like a giant in second grade. And her thing, MYOB. MYOB. See, I learned a lot in Catholic school. I learned move and MYOB. The rest of it I learned at home. Do it right or don't do it at all. But well, folks, MYOB, mind your own business. Do what God has you to do. And don't worry about what he has someone else to do. Because this is one of the big things that goes on. And especially in religious life. I'm talking to the religious for a minute. Okay? Well, you know, they're doing that. I don't think I could ever possibly do that. I don't know if I could ever go. Who cares about what you could do? It's about what God wants to do through the other person. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. MYOB. 
Now, this is all of our business. And it's in the first line of the rule of St. Francis. The first line of our rule is this. The life of the Friars Minor is to live the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Boom. Bingo. There you have it. We have a winner. And then St. Francis taught us when he said shortly before his death, God showed me what was mine to do. May he show you what is yours to do. And that's a challenge for us because as we heard at Fatima, Jesus has a work for you. And I'm going to give you two suggestions for work. One has to do with the crisis of mass attendance. We're going through this in the Archdiocese of Chicago right now. For those of you who are involved in Renew My Church or have looked at any of the data, it's alarming. 20 to 25% of people go to Mass on Sunday. Where are the others? Good question. 85% of kids confirmed leave the church after confirmation. These are alarming numbers. If they don't get us to move, what will? Does somebody need to light a stick of dynamite under us? Maybe. <laughs> but we have a crisis, a crisis, a crisis. And I think we need to remind ourselves of the treasure of the Eucharist. An elderly lady volunteered at her parish, and she was given the keys to open up the school building for a weekly senior citizens meeting. And one night at the end of the meeting, as she always did, she checked for her car keys and she couldn't find them. She checked her purse, her coat, every pocket. She gave herself a TSA pat down. She finally, she finally realized she must have left them in the car. She frantically went to the front of the school building, looked out and saw the empty parking lot, and remembered her husband scolding her many times for leaving the keys in the car's ignition. He was afraid the car would be stolen. And as she looked around the parking lot, she realized he was right. Not wanting to call him, she went around and cleaned up the coffee area, checked the bathrooms, <laughs> shut off the lights. But first, she wisely called the police and told them what had happened and confessed that she had left the keys in the car and that it had been stolen. So after delaying as much as she could, cleaning the whole school, she made the most difficult call she had to make to her husband. And she said, "Hun, I left my keys in the car and it's been stolen. And there was a moment of silence on the other end of the phone. She thought she was disconnected. But then she heard his voice. Are you kidding me? He barked. I dropped you off at that meeting. <laughs> now it was her turn to be silent. And after a moment, she said, embarrassed, well, can you come and get me? <laughs> And he said, I will, as soon as I convince this cop I didn't steal your car. <laughs> reminders, reminders. We all need reminders. We need reminders about the great treasure of the Eucharist. Jesus is truly present. I don't go to the Mass because of the height of the candlesticks. I don't go to Mass because of the number of tulips or lack of tulips. <laughs> Maybe you do, but if that gets you there, go. But then realize the importance of going there. One year I made a retreat and I used the book from Cardinal Von Tron, the dead, now dead, Cardinal from Hanoi. And he gave a retreat to Pope John Paul II and the curious shortly before his death. It was fascinating. And he said the most powerful mass he ever said was not in his cathedral in Hanoi. It was not in the Vatican. It was on the altar of his hand where people snuck in medicine, quote unquote, which was wine, and he saved a few scraps of bread. If we really know what's going on at the mass, it's not boring. And it doesn't matter about the trappings. I'm glad we had a beautiful mass, by the way. Very, very glad. But if we had a less festive mass, would Jesus be any less present? Of course not. 
we were giving a retreat down on the border with Mexico a number of years ago, probably now, geez, 20 years ago. We were down there, and at the planning meeting, we began with a mass, and we had a dinner, and then we were going to make a holy hour. And the pastor was a little bit perturbed, because some of the people that were supposed to be at the mass and the dinner and the holy hour were at bingo in the church hall. So I said, well, Father, how about if we have a little Eucharistic procession around the parking lot, and maybe we could go into the bingo hall. He goes, oh, no, Father, we can't do that. So I said, all right, well, wouldn't it be nice to bless the property? You know, we'll have a holy hour, and we'll do a little Eucharistic procession. That's fine, but we're not going into the bingo hall. I didn't hear that. So as we came out of the church, we went around the parking lot, and it was the incense, two candles, me and then all the people that were there. And so I said, guys, we're going into the hall. <laughs> the pastor was way in the back. And so they said, Father, there's a thing going on. I said, go to the door. <laughs> go to the door. So they go to the door. I said, open the door. I have the blessed sacrament. So I'm like, open the door. <laughs> they might have thought it was Jesus speaking. So they open the door, and in we go. B12! Oh, whoa! So the caller said, we've got to stop. People turned, and I held the Blessed Sacrament up high. People got on their knees, and we had benediction in place of bingo. Okay? Now, what I'm getting at, this is my point. Be a little bit creative. For, be creative for the love of God. We used to have creative people in religious life and in the priesthood. They built everything that we're allowing to fall apart. You see what I'm getting at? Let's get off our ducks and get moving. And let's be a little bit creative. If they're not going to come to Jesus, let's bring Jesus to them. And let's do it. done. For those of you who are keeping time, because I have about four minutes, right? All right. I think I'm probably already over, but all right, bear with me, and then I'm going to exit so you can't throw anything. <laughs> and just don't throw my dessert because I have a sweet tooth. <laughs> Conversion is part of the message of Fatima. What about the sacrament of reconciliation? What about it? Do we ever talk about it? It's the unused sacrament. I was walking out of church today, and some young people that were just on the property for whatever reason, they're not part of this. They came up to me and they said, uh, are you a priest or a brother? I said, a priest. Can I go to confession? I was hearing confessions on the side of the library. And then I came over here to get into the reception and another kid walks up to me and says, uh, Father, excuse me, I hate to bother you, but can I go to confession? People, how in the world are you going to be converted if you don't realize you're a sinner? How many times do I hear confession? I go around and preach all over the place. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been 12 years since my last confession. You know, I'm a good person. I go to Mass most Sundays. You know, I do. Hey, hey. Confession isn't about your canonization. It's about your sins. It's about your sins. It, it's not, it's not your, your take on what you want people to present to Rome for your, your canonization. We've got, it, we've got it all backwards. And let's be honest, it's not easy living life. I remember hearing about a, a retired couple that used to have their coffee together in the morning. And they would sit there quietly reading parts of the paper. And the husband was annoyed with the wife this one day. He put the paper down and he said, oh, I don't know how you could be so stupid and so beautiful all at the same time. And the wife heard that and she put her section of the paper down. And she said, well, let me explain. <laughs> God made me so beautiful so you would be attracted to me. And God made me so stupid so I would be attracted to you. <laughs> Now, what does it say about marriage? The 
sanctity of your spouse. Oh, I get all that. Believe me, I get it. But there's also another part of it. You can get under each other's skin. We need confession. Be ambassadors of the sacrament of reconciliation. I was at a deanery meeting a year ago in our area. Okay? So I said, well, you know, why don't we do this thing? Let's open up the churches and, you know, oh, we can't. It's a bad neighborhood. Those we can't. We've never done it. We've never done it that way. We can't do it. I said, well, let's try it. Anybody willing to try? So, all right, two priests said yes. I said, all right, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay? Because for whatever reason, they asked me to be a dean. They probably regret it. But remember, I got the letter. I got the letter in the mail. I thought it was a joke. So I said, and so at any rate, but I am. So I said, well, I'll do what I got to do. So we opened the church, right? People actually came to confession. We exposed the Blessed Sacrament, dimmed the lights, candles, beautiful music. People went to confession throughout the night. Bishop Rojas from our area was going to come for an hour, stayed for four. This year we did it, the lines were 20 and 30 deep. Okay? We've never done it that way. But we've never done it that way. Don't be afraid. And don't be afraid to fail. That's why things never get done differently. Because we've always done it that way. And that's a problem in religious life. And that's why some people want to turn the clock back to 1948 or 1958, or 1963, <laughs> or whatever year you want to turn the dial back to, have a safe trip in your time machine. <laughs> but we have to live right now in this era, in this era. Michelangelo has a great line. The greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it's too low and we reach it. The greater danger for most of us is not that our aim in life is too high and we miss it, but that it's too low and we reach it. Let's get our, let's, let, let's up our game, okay? Could we up our game, please? Okay, look at the wonderful people out here. Oh, oh, our food pantry's open two hours once a month and I'm exhausted just talking about it. You're exhausted for two hours a month? You've got to be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. You see what I'm trying to get at? You're exhausted because you're bored. <laughs> or you're exhausted because you're lazy. Okay? So, how's that? Now here's the <laughs> And here's the conclusion. And here's the conclusion. Okay, so the bottom line is what? Just become a saint and get it over with. Okay? <laughs> That's it. Pope John Paul II told us to become the saints of the new millennium. So become a saint. I'll give you a real simple definition, okay? Because I only remember simple things. You can probably tell I'm a simple priest. I remember one lady comes to me after a parish mission. She goes, Father, you're really like a real simple mind. <laughs> so I said, well, well, thank you very, very much. I, I didn't understand what she was saying. <laughs> So here's my simple definition of a saint. Saints, ordinary people doing ordinary things in an extraordinary way. Ordinary people doing ordinary things in an extraordinary way. Whatever you do, you're changing candlesticks on the altar, do it with love, love for God and love for neighbor. You're changing bed sheets for the elderly in a home for the elderly, do it with love. That's what it is. And remember, all the saints, were a cast of characters. And this is the conclusion. In a convent in Ireland, there was a 98-month-year-old Mother Superior who was dying. The nuns gathered around her bed, trying to make her last hours comfortable. They tried to give her some warm milk to drink, but she refused it. One of the nuns took the glass back to the kitchen. Then, remembering a bottle of Irish whiskey that had been received as a gift the previous Christmas, she opened it and poured a generous amount into the warm milk. Back at the Mother Superior's bed, they held the glass to her lips. The frail nun took a sip, and then another sip, and then a gulp. And before they knew it, she had finished the whole glass down to the last drop. Her eyes brightened, and the nuns thought it would be a good opportunity to have one last chat with their spiritual leader, Mother the nuns asked earnestly, please give us some of your wisdom before you depart for eternity. She raised herself up in bed on one elbow, looked at them and said, 
don't sell that cow. <laughs>